Hi, this is Josh Cohen with Aptus Center for Transportation Excellence. Today we are kicking off CFTE's inaugural bus tour with a trip across the country from Washington, D.C. to Portland, Oregon. This is the first in a series of virtual bus stops in which we travel from city to city to talk to the campaign managers running some of the most exciting, innovative public transit campaigns on the ballot. We are honored to be joined by Abigail Dorr, manager for the Let's Get Moving campaign. Abigail, welcome to our bus tour. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, uh, can you tell us what is included in this measure? Yeah, so the Get Moving measure is a regional transportation package that brought together a coalition of stakeholders to address long overdue transportation needs. Um, if you look down at the nitty gritty of the measure, it will make long overdue investments in 17 of our region's most dangerous and congested corridors. It'll invest in 115 to 120 miles of roadway improvements, 60 miles of roadway planning, 25 to 30 miles of new bus lanes, signal prioritizations for buses, new max, uh, 22 miles of new max line, um, light rail line. There's sidewalk, street, 4,000 street lights in this measure. It is an it is a measure that's address, addressing long overdue safety and transportation needs. I think the other really incredible part of this measure is that it will address a long history of ignoring black and brown communities in the Portland metro area. So it'll make investments in communities that don't have sidewalks, that um, have a longer commute time. And really, the really incredible part about this measure is it brought together communities um, who have not normally had a seat at the decision-making table and addressing transportation needs. So this is a very exciting, um, very important measure that will create thousands of jobs, address traffic and congestion, and uh, make our whole region safer for, for the people who need it most. That sounds great. Um, so the region in the past has proposed a number of transportation measures. Uh, can you tell us some of the reasons or some of the ways in which this measure is different? Yeah, so there's, um, I think in a lot of transportation spaces, a lot of, in the past, a lot of decisions around where um, light rail should go, where, how much light rail we should have, where bus service should go, where are we investing our sidewalk, our money for sidewalks and regional transportation investments have been made at the state capitol, have been made in boardrooms behind closed doors with a lot of community members not at the table. So Metro, the regional planning body of government, spent 18 months bringing together um, the people who would who have the most stake in this measure and have often been ignored in these processes. Um, a 35 member task force of business, community organizations, communities of color, labor, and elected leaders spent 18 months really diving into the details, going to the corridors, looking at all of the options that um, at play, looking at the research and the data together to then recommend this package to come forward. Um, it was a labor of love. I think we're, we've also plugged in a lot of these um, task force members into our campaign and they're they're like we've been here from the beginning. This is a lot of work. We can't we can't not just see this all the way through because of the the way that um, Metro conducted this work, it really, you know, I, I think it really brings people, it, it brought people to the table that don't normally have a voice in these decision making processes, which is really unique and a really, I think it made it a much stronger, um, more equitable, certainly more equitable package. Well, that's really great. Uh, and, and I think it shows in the, like, the, the composition of the measure itself, uh, which isn't just about transit, it's about biking and walking and driving and even housing. Uh, so can you talk a little bit of a little bit more about how um, uh, the decision was made to create a, a, a mixed transit package like this? Yeah, I think um, I think the community process that I talked about really led to um, an understanding and a recognition of the holistic needs for a fully functioning transportation system for our buses to arrive on time for our buses not to be stuck in traffic we need to make sure that they have dedicated bus lanes we need to make sure that um, people who bike can safely get around and aren't impeding or mm -hmm. um, are at risk of 
being hit by cars. Um, and we need to make sure that our pedestrians can safely walk in our streets. All of these are connected for a thriving, um, a thriving transportation system. And you brought up housing. Housing is a really big part of this as well. Um, Anti-displacement, we love transit, we love investing in our communities, but we also know that sometimes when we do that, it means it's no longer affordable for the people who was intended to benefit. And so making sure that there's an intentional effort to invest in the communities who we want to benefit from this transit, that there's affordable housing plans, that they're coordinated and connected is really critical to addressing the equity elements in this measure and making sure that we're building a a walking, thriving um, infrastructure that works for everybody in our community. And, you know, we can add as much transit service we, as we need, but if our, our infrastructure that's not allowing it to move quickly and reliably through our region for any user, it doesn't do us any good. So we need both. We need the service, we need the infrastructure to to um, really address the holistic needs of our transportation network. Uh, very nice. It sounds like you guys did a lot of work to get there. Um, it also, uh, you know, you had been discussing the idea of a ballot measure for years and had been doing the planning and uh, the coalition work and the outreach, uh, and then coronavirus hit. Uh, and you were put in a position, like a lot of other communities, uh, where you had to make a decision. Do you wanna press voters to uh, make an investment in their community now in the middle of a pandemic, or do we wanna wait? Uh, you obviously decided to move forward. Uh, why did you make that decision or how did you reach that decision? Yeah, I think that it was really clear from our community members and from our, our Metro Councilor who, Council who heard from community members to move forward because we've been kicking the can down the road a really long time on these projects. Many of these corridors have been ignored by elected leaders for years. Um, the Tualatin Valley Highway is a project that's invested in this, and this is an unsafe, dangerous corridor, and that problem is not going to go away if we wait two, three, four, five years, because we've waited long enough. Um, our community partners who were involved with this said, now's the time. We need the investment in jobs. Mm -hmm. This will create 37,000 um, jobs over the course of 10 to 15 years, many of which can begin our shovel ready and can begin as soon as next year. We need that local investment. We need the federal matching funds to come to our region to make sure that we are getting back to work. And now is the best time to be making that decision. Uh, or making those investments. And that is what the Metro Council heard pretty loudly and clearly from many, many community partners um, to move. And that's why we, we decided to move forward. Um, so we are now a couple of weeks away from the election. Uh, enough with policy, let's talk politics. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you created the Let's Get Moving campaign itself? Absolutely. I think similar to how this measure was drafted, we didn't unfortunately have 18 months. You know this, who's worked in campaigns a lot. Time, money, and uh, time and money are your two most valuable resources. Mm -hmm. Time is something we don't have a lot of. And um, coronavirus certainly delayed the timeline for how we were bringing together a coalition. But I think something that was really clear from the community partners that shaped the package is that they, they wanted this measure to be led by the community as well. Mm -hmm. And so we've built a camp, a broad coalition of labor, uh, community organizations, um, any community from the Oregon Food Bank to Coalition for Communities of Color. Mm -hmm. um, we have business, we have business support um, from places you wouldn't expect. And this is led by these community leaders and the decisions are made and how we're, how we're running this. We know we need 440,000, about 440,000 votes to win this. We are working hard to get there and that's running a strong TV campaign, a strong mail campaign, and making sure that we're, we're really activating our biggest strength, which is our coalition, uh, to engage both in getting the word out, both from getting the word out and explaining and putting our community partners up front on why this is important. So 
Uh, 440,000 voters total, which means uh, a win number of around 220,000. Oh, no, that's our win number. It's win about 800,000 voters. We need 440,000 votes to win this thing. So 440,000 votes to win. Uh, how are you, um, without revealing too much, too many trade secrets or uh, sort of confidential polling nuggets, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the types of voters you are targeting and why, uh, mm -hmm. and then some of the message that, messages that you found to be most persuasive? Yeah, I think there's sort of two types of voters. We have our strongest supporters. We're also at the not quite the very bottom. There's some school bonds and library, uh, library measures in different parts of the region, but we're, mm -hmm. we're near the very bottom of the ballot. So we need to make sure that our strongest supporters who are probably voting really early will make it with our library levies and our school bonds to the very bottom of the ballot. We just need them to vote. And then we have, um, then we have folks who I think have legitimate questions about the measure, but when they hear about the benefits, they're much more likely to support what's mm -hmm. going on. These are often the financial decision makers in their household. They have responsibilities. They want the best for our kids, but mm -hmm. everybody in this region knows that we have transportation infrastructure that needs some TLC. Mm -hmm. and so when we can talk about the traffic safety investments, when we can talk about the safety for our kids, um, and our communities, when we talk about how we've kicked the can down the road for far too long on these projects, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't want to wait any longer. They want to make these investments. So that's who we're reaching. And those are the stories um, we're telling. One other thing that people are also very excited about is how much, how many jobs are in this measure yeah. and the opportunity to leverage federal funding and get our region back to work. Like everybody else, our economy is struggling and making sure that we are, are investing in ourselves and investing in our community resonates really well to these, um, these voters. Um, so speaking of resonating with voters, uh, Portland, it's, the, the campaign is facing an exciting, uh, albeit dishonest, opposition campaign. Uh, what are you guys hearing from the other side and how are you responding? Yeah, I think we're hearing a lot of what we, we've seen in a lot of transportation campaigns. Um, now is just not the right time. Um, our opposition is really digging into the, the process. They're seeding doubt and laying, laying around doubt in government's ability to deliver transportation projects. And then I think probably frustrating to you as well is really questioning the need for transit period mm -hmm. um, and really saying that we don't we don't need investments in transit and transportation. I think the thing that surprised me a lot is we do have sophisticated opposition. We have um, we are in a head to head race there. We're fundraising at similar levels. Um, we're competing on the airwaves. But I think the thing that's I've worked on many campaigns and I think the thing that surprised me is that there is a lack of sophistication in our opposition and there is some, uh, there's petty games that are playing that are meant to distract us. And we've got our eyes on the, on election day and are really working hard to not get wrapped up in any of those games. That's smart. Uh, disciplined campaigns usually are the ones that win on election day. That and money sometimes is what, what that helps. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> so, uh, Last question. You're a seasoned campaign vet. Uh, you've been in the trenches on other campaigns. Uh, you've managed other campaigns. Uh, what has surprised you so far about this measure? Yeah, I think what has surprised me the most, I've worked in the Puget Sound region. I've followed CFTE's work with partnering organizations in LA, the Bay Area, in, um, in many, many parts of the country. And I think the thing that I've always been impressed with and what I love working on transportation is the way that we can bring people together from especially the business community. And I've been surprised and frankly disappointed by the lack of, uh, the lack of, um, engagement from our major corporations in this region and the lack of sort of connecting the dots on why transportation and investing in transit mm -hmm. is so good for our communities. It's good for our economies. It is good for the health and vitality of our, our future. And it's been really disappointing and, and surprising to see the business community here not willing to step up like 
the leadership I've seen mm -hmm. with from the business communities in other parts of the country and other communities that I've worked in. Yeah, it's surprising to see as well, especially when you look at uh, regions like uh, like Florida and, and Hillsborough County and Hamilton County, where the business communities led the charge. Um, it's really surprising and disappointing, frankly, to see uh, from Portland, Portland corporations. You know, and our, our community partners are leading the way. And I think this is a unique opportunity to, to, to listen to our community leaders. And the door is always open for the business community to join in. <laughs> Uh, Abigail, we really appreciate you joining the CFTE bus here for a few minutes. Uh, I hope your commute home is uh, quick and easy uh, and good luck out there. We'll, uh, we'll be in touch throughout and of course anything that CFTE can do, uh, let us know. Awesome, thank you.